Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good good whatever. I just say hello to everybody. I'm very happy that you're all here for our first UPU DMAB innovation talk on artificial intelligence in marketing, sales and service. I really would like to say welcome to everybody. I can't do it in all your languages because there are so many languages, so many countries participating. But I really would say I'm very happy and very proud to be the moderator of this session. Um, just to, to give you some idea who you are and who I am, I'm Martin Nitsche, I'm from Germany. I'm a, well, 25 years veteran in marketing and CRM, wrote several books about that and uh, working for a long time in the German uh, Direct Marketing Association. And as well, I'm a uh, member of the board of the European Direct Marketing Association and chairman of the board of the Worldwide Marketing Association. So I'm very happy and I'm very proud to be part uh, of this um, session we have today. And I would like to give over to Olivier Bussard from the DMAB from the UPU. Olivier, it's your turn. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me uh, okay, and, and welcome to you all to this, uh, to this session. Um, and on behalf of the uh, Universal Postal Union's Direct Marketing Advisory Board, it's really a great pleasure for me to welcome you all uh, to this innovation talk. Um, as you may know, the UPU's uh, Direct Marketing Advisory Board is a group of postal operators and, and private sector stakeholders uh, who aims is to promote direct marketing uh, through postal channels. Uh, as you know, in view of uh, e-commerce and the data revolution and the use of digital media channels, direct marketing is currently undergoing a profound transformation, yet remaining a key activity for post. Uh, in June this year, we hosted a series of five online sessions, uh, which address the main drivers of this new ecosystem in which direct marketing operates as well as how postal operators can adapt and respond by building on the channel strategies. We also addressed during those sessions um, the impacts of the current COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, situation and, and, and the direct impact on, on, on marketing and direct marketing. Those webinars were very, very successful. We, we had more than 100 participants. and I think Today, we even broke uh, that record. Um, and uh, the full report of the session for your information is available on our, on our website or on, re on request. You can contact myself or Abhi Bosar and, and uh, get the full report with very, very interesting insights from those five online sessions we had in June. Um, given the success uh, of those uh, uh, webinars we had in June, we decided to continue uh, the conversation and to organize with the support of Martin. Uh, our moderator, a new series of workshops in the form of innovation talks uh, with global experts. Uh, during our discussions in June, uh, a number of topics emerged as being of great interest uh, to direct marketers and postal operators. And one of those uh, topics was the impact and value of, of artificial intelligence on the way we do business as direct marketers or as managers responsible for postal operators marketing. It's for this reason that we have decided to start today our new series of webinars with this specific topic. And to this end, we're very, very happy to welcome today Professor Peter Gensch. Uh, Professor Gensch is a global expert in digital transformation, business intelligence, and innovation. And uh, he will share with us today his experience, views, and perspective on artificial intelligence in marketing, sales, and services. So on behalf of the UPU and the Direct Marketing Advisory Board, I would like to thank Professor Gensch for taking the time to be with us today. It's a great pleasure. And I wish you all a very enjoyable hour of discovery and discussion. And back to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivier. And thank you for this nice opening. I'm, I'm really proud that we talk, topped the results from June. So in June, we were very, very successful. And we were very proud that we had more than 100 participants. Today, for our two sessions today, we have 237 registrations, and this is about an hour old, so it's probably even more by now. It, it went up over the last 24 hours from 200, more, less than 200 to more than 250. 
And all these registrations are coming from more than 68 countries. And I just see that most of you already found the, the comment and the, sec, uh, the chat section of this uh, presentation. So I'm very happy that all of you are saying good morning, good afternoon, good day, hello. And I, I really urge you to keep on. So it's very good that we get some interaction and that we get some questions. We are all about dialogue. We are about uh, not about monologue. So I would really be happy that we get into a dialogue with Peter and that we get a lot of questions uh, after his presentation. Just to let you know, um, the whole presentation uh, will be in, uh, in English, uh, but the, the, there is some possibility for, the, for the, 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 the desktop. You can put that one in other languages if you want to do that, but the, there is no direct translation here. So the, the presentation will be in English. So if you go up to the small world map, you can switch to another uh, language for the for the surface of your desktop. Um, again, there's the chat pod on the lower right. I see that most of you already found that. So whenever you have a question, you can put it down there and just write it. And then we will see that you wrote this question or this comment. And I would be really happy that you send a lot of comments or a lot of questions. What we will do is I will switch over to Peter in some seconds and he will do about 30 minutes presentation um, so that we are have enough time of 15 to 20 minutes afterwards to have a really, really lovely discussion. Um, and I would be happy if all of you can, can go into this discussion. The, the topic of artificial intelligence is so interesting so that i'm really sure that we will have a lot of questions from you so that was it from my point of view i would like to switch over now to professor dr peter gensch he is one of the most renowned experts on artificial intelligence he just wrote a book about artificial intelligence in marketing sales and services he has his own Wikipedia page, so I think that is just one of the things you should know that he is a real expert. And I'm very, very happy, and we are really honored that he said, okay, I will do this with you. So Peter, thanks a lot for being with us, and I would like to give over to you. It's your floor, and we are happy that you are here. So yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and invitation. Great honor to be with you, at least virtually. And I'm really happy to share my thoughts on AI and marketing sales service. And now, hopefully, you can see the screen. I think it takes some seconds, so I have to share that. So this looks perfect. Looks perfect, OK. No, that was end sharing. So, no, we, we can't see your screen yeah, anymore. Give me just a second. So, okay, once again, I have to share that. So, now you should see the presentation, hopefully. We, we see the presentation and now we see it perfectly. You're set. Great. The problem is always on the user side. So I'm talking about artificial intelligence. So I think I have to improve my human intelligence skills. OK, AI and marketing, sales and service. I think there's no other technology out there that is overhyped and underhyped at the same time. You know, On the one side, we have a lack of fantasy, but we just think of marketing automation or self-driving cars. On the other hand, we have the science fiction stuff, you know, when Arnold Schwarzenegger comes into play and talks about Terminator and that stuff. And I think we have to discuss the use cases in between. And I think it's really important to fix expectations because there's so much buzz around the AI. And sometimes it's not AI in marketing. Sometimes they use AI for marketing as a marketing slogan, as a marketing claim. You know, a lot of software vendors claim they have AI inside in order to better to sell their products. Um, so I don't want to, to spoil the excitement. I'm a huge fan of artificial intelligence. It's a powerful tool. I think it's important to fix expectation. And um, hopefully I can give you some insights 
how we can use AI in marketing, sales, and service. Okay, um, let's have a look at the agenda. I would like to touch upon the following things. I want to start with lead customer prediction and profiling to know the next 1,000 customers based on AI. Then there's a huge hype around conversation and AI. So how can we use chatbot and all that stuff for marketing and service? Then I would uh, have a look at the media planning. And finally, I would come up with some use cases, how you can use AI for content marketing. Hopefully, um, there's something for everybody. In case there's something missing, I think we can jump on that, having our Q&A session. OK, let's get started. And yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> you, we have to talk about the excitement of AI. And now I want to bore you and have to bore you with data. Maybe you know the slogan, data is your new oil. I don't like that. It's not that delicious. I think data is your new bacon. Because there's no AI without data. As simple as it sounds, it's all about data. And I have a short uh, contest for you guys. Uh, it should be very easy. Maybe you have an idea who's behind this profile. It's a person you all know. It's born 1948, raised in England, married for the sick time, two children, successful business, wealthy, like to spend holidays in the Alps and like dogs. So it's not that easy to get this feedback in this digital environment. Um, so maybe I'm not sure if you have an idea who is behind. If not, it's our Ozzy Osbourne. Huh. OK, that, but guys, I have another profile for you. It seems to be the same profile. No, it's actually, it's, it's completely the same profile. It's not only similar. So it's the same person. But it's not Ozzy Osbourne. We all know Ozzy Osbourne do not have a twin print, does not have a twin print uh, uh, brother. So it's another person. And you all know this person, and this is Prince Charles. So maybe you know the, the definition of customer relationship management, treating different persons differently. But how the hell should I treat these persons differently? Because they seem to have the same profile. OK, but Facebook, for example, makes a difference. So there's not only Facebook. There are a huge amount of data out there explaining customer insight. What's the difference between Ossie Osborne and Prince Charles? It's not only Facebook. It's Instagram, our websites, you name it. There are tons of data out there you can use um, to get better customer insights, even though that we all know that they do not write their own Facebook fan pages, of course. But they are very much telling. And if you use AI, you can try to track what's going on in the internet. You can try to find intense triggers. And you can really derive insights about the audience. Um, and it's not always the demographics that are important. It's also what's going on on social media, for example. This example is related to the B2C area, but it also works for the B2B area. And I think you all know with uh, where with the so-called um, demographics or the firmographics. The firmographics is uh, the companies are related to a certain industry, has a certain revenue, number of employees, and all that stuff. So this is company A, Lafayette, and the other is Kiko Milano, a completely different uh, company. So, but if you look on the website, if you look what's going on on social media, you will find the difference between these two. Um, companies. So what I'm trying to say, we have big data, and I can help us to unleash the value of big data. Today, we have 44 uh, setup bytes, which is <laughs> a lot of data. Um, and what I would like to show is that, for example, for companies, you can capture so many data out there. Uh, as I mentioned, so what's going on on social media? Uh, what is the web traffic on the website? What are the people looking for? How they are connected with each other? There are so many data points you can take into account in order to derive customer insights, in order to run campaigns that are fit uh, with your um, audience. So having this said, I think now we have to explain what is AI about. But please keep in mind, it makes and breaks with data. OK, uh, another uh, short. A contest quiz for you guys, which I think it's pretty easy to answer. 
Um, what's the difference? You might say, oh, that's really easy. So there's a, a muffin and there's a nice dog. So something to cuddling with, something to eat. Hopefully that is a difference. Um, but you won't believe there's no AI out there that could make the difference, provided we only have these amount of data. But because of big data, we have tons of pics on Insta, on Facebook, you name it. And what you can see 10 years ago, human being were better when it comes to image recognition. But then we have a tipping point. The AI tries to catch up. And now AI is doing a better job when it comes to image recognition. But it depends on the data. You need to have training data um, to use AI. And that brings me to my definition. AI is a study of how to make computers do things at which at the moment people are better. There are a lot of tasks in marketing which we human beings do a great job, but AI is catching up. So that's a definition. It's not that fixed de definition. It's a rather dynamic definition. And maybe you remember 1996, there was uh, Gary Kasparov, and it was the world best champion player. And it, he uh, lost against um, an AI which was created by IBM. It's called Deep, Deep Blue. He never lost a game, but then he uh, lost again um, he, um, against uh, Deep Blue. N nobody could imagine. And the funny thing, once AI reaches a level of maturity and could win against uh, a chess player, it's not called artificial intelligence anymore. And then 2016, people thought, oh, it's AI would be great when it, it would be possible to win against Lisa Doll. I'm not sure if you know Lisa Doll. Lisa Doll is a Korean uh, guy, which is the world champion in playing Go. Go is the oldest board game in the world, and it's really hard to play. It requires strategic thinking. So you have to be creative. All the privilege we human beings have, so the machine cannot be creative, you would say. And I can strongly recommend a documentary at Netflix uh, because they show this battle between man and machine. And the software is called DeepMind, AlphaGo. And Lisa Doll uh, went to the press and was pretty optimistic because he never lost a game and he will win again. He lost the first game, he lost the second game, he lost the third game. And then again, he stepped in front of the press and I think this is really amazing because he said this move was really creative and beautiful. So what I'm trying to say, AI is not only about to automate processes, but also to come up with new things to be creative and beautiful. And the first, the first game, you won't believe, Lisa Doll won uh, the first game. Everybody felt relief. We can win against the machine. And this move is called the God move because no AI could predict that move and no human being have ever played that move. Just think of that. Would Lisa Doll have ever played that move if he had, wouldn't be challenged by an AI? So, and this is my definition of AI, augmented intelligence. How can we use AI to come up with better decisions? How can AI help us to do a better job? The question is, some bad tongues say, oh, that's not new AI. So we have regression, maybe even an Excel sheet is some kind of artificial intelligence. But what's new is that AI becomes more and more autonomous. AI learns to learn. If you compare that to the example of Gary Kasparov, that's completely different. Uh, in the case of uh, Kasparov, the AI was trained. The people explained the AI how chess works. In the case of Go, the system was completely left unsupervised. So the system learned to learn how to play Go. And I think this is a tipping point. This is a game changer when it comes to AI. The system are getting more and more proactive. They are more and more autonomous and they learn to learn. And that's completely new and that's good news. Okay, but we don't want to talk about AI for gaming. We want to talk uh, about AI for businesses. And we, in particular, we want to have this deep dive, how can we use AI for marketing, service, and sales? And there's a, a research conducted by McKinley two years ago, and they tried to figure out uh, which is the 
biggest lever for AI in, in the business environment because you know you can use AI for predictive maintenance, you can use AI for HR, for example. And the interesting thing that they found out that the most important part to use AI is a customer facing area. So I think it's worth looking at the customer facing area because we can really unleash the value of AI. Um, and sometimes you need that begging that McKinsey uh, do some research underlying the importance of AI in the customer facing area. Okay, now it's a rather complex slide, but it's really important because I would like to outline the solution space of AI in marketing, sales, and service. So on the left side, you see all the use cases that are related to automation. So it's mainly about how can we automate processes? How can we gain efficiency? How can we reduce cost and all that stuff? And you see the bubble size reflects the level of maturity and the color reflects the level of usage. So I give you an example. For example, real-time bidding. This is a technology based on AI, which is pretty advanced. It's highly automated, but the business impact is not that high. In contrast to that, we have pricing based on AI. For example, Amazon is doing a perfect job using AI for personalized pricing. Okay, this has a high business impact. In particular, in Europe, it's not that mature because companies are afraid of using that because, you know, that kind of customer democracy, they don't want to display different prices. So they're struggling with that, even though that dynamic pricing based on AI has a huge business impact, okay? On the other hand, we have the more creative part of marketing when it comes to brand management, the strategic perspective of marketing, media planning, storytelling, influencer marketing, and all this stuff. And you see the bubbles are not that big and they're not the deep colored, but it's changing. So AI is more and more tapping into the more creative part. Okay, so this is more or less a solution a matrix of AI and marketing sales and service. And now I would like to touch upon some of these use cases and give you some illustrations showing some best practices. Okay, um, and I would like to start with lead prediction. So how can we use AI to predict the next customer? So, um, and this is example of Ströer. I'm not sure if you're aware of Ströer. It's a pretty popular company, at least and in Germany. They do a lot of digital things, so they run a lot of campaigns. They had a lot of digital companies that belong to that company. So uh, they are campaigning all the day. So, and the question is, what is the right audience to engage with? So what is the next customer? And this is usually done by human beings, by sales reps. And what we did is we used AI in order to predict the next 1,000 customers. How does it work? Um, you have customers, hopefully, maybe you have A customers. And then the A customers are enriched by different data. As I mentioned before, this could be social media data, digital data, websites, you name it. And then you have a very detailed view on the company. You have more than 10,000 data points representing a company. Not only the firmographics, the industry, number of employees, all this stuff, but also the digital and social data. And then AI automatically detects so-called lookalike audience. Companies you don't know, but they seem to be similar. Okay, and the system also provides you, okay, this is a company you should approach via LinkedIn. This is a company you should approach via the traditional way. And then you can engage with the audience and then the system have to learn. So the system helps you to detect leads. It helps you to profile the leads. Um, and this works really, really well. Um, and the discussion came up, okay, AI is gonna replace a sales rep? And I said, no, no sales rep should be afraid of an AI. A sales rep should be afraid of an employee that is armed with AI because he can focus on the real valuable task like empathy, uh, delivering a perfect customer experience. So I wouldn't say that AI is replacing sales rep. AI helps you to, to keep track what's going on, helps us to find intents, help us to find triggers we can jump on. 
And so this is really a powerful tool if you, you want to come up with new customers. You can also use that uh, technology to enrich existing customers because maybe you want to have more insights about the existing customers. Maybe you want to run a campaign and then it's important to know, is there anything I have to know? Maybe they launch a new product, maybe they are struggling with a competitor, maybe there's a new CEO, whatever. So there are so many insights you can use for campaigning, for marketing, in order to approach your audience. So it automates the process to a certain degree so that you have, as a marketer, more time for the really creative part of your job. So the next one, it's about service and engagement. You know the slogan, services in marketing. So I want to talk how we can use AI to deliver And not only to react uh, the proaction. So the left side is the goal days of customer engagement. On the right side, you need uh, you see that new way when AI come into play. And you know, I think you heard of this bot chatbots based on AI. Um, what does it mean? I give you a short overview when we talk about chatbots. Um, of course, we can use these chatbot within our messenger system. We can use it are at Facebook Messenger, WeChat, WhatsApp, you name it. We also have chatbots on our mobile for the mobile uh, websites, or we can use it on the web to answer questions. And we have also this kind of smart speaker, so you can talk to Alexa, Amazon, Google Home, and all that stuff. So they all try to deliver customer experience based on an automated process. To be honest, I have to say the current status is not that good. There's a lot room for improvement. Um, if you try to check out how the bots are working right now, um, they're not really delivering good customer experience. And my, maybe that the reason for that is that a lot of companies underestimate the effort that is required to come up with chatbots. It's not a plug and play solution. And I would strongly recommend not to install a bot if you could not ensure a certain quality because you can kill customer experience. That doesn't mean that you have a perfect AI. That doesn't mean that you have the perfect bot, but you have to ensure that you answer the question of your customers. Interestingly enough, Facebook now requires the so-called escalation parse. So you have to ensure once the AI is not able to give an answer, you have to define the workflow, how it's rooted to the human agent giving an answer. So the, yet you really can assure 100% reliability. So smart bots work in a way that once they get to a certain limit, that they have a smart handover to the human being. I think that's a perfect mix. And I have to say there are so really awesome achievements in the field of conversational AI. And I will provide you with some examples. And therefore, I have a short video. Hopefully, you can hear that because I think it's, it's really amazing. So I just start this video that gives you an idea what uh, AI is able to deliver when it comes to conversational business. 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think. AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. How oh, happy I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. OK. 
Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Mm. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So hopefully this could give you some, some flavor how it could look like to have this customer experience based on AI. And it's not a rule-based system. Most of the bots we have right now are if then. So it sucks so much time actually um, to create all these rules. And here we use deep learning. It's a kind of a neural network that automatically find the pattern and come up with answers. Um, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe on the right side there's um, Amazon Alexa. Uh, that would be crazy. Then we have two bots talking with each other in a pseudo empathic way. And I thought, the machines understand zeros and one in a better way. Um, but anyway, this is a narrow intelligence. The system wouldn't be able to play Go, of course, but it's able to, to answer question of your customers, and it's not based on, 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 on rules. Uh, there are a lot of other examples also for daily life, and I hope you all are in strong, committed relationships, and you're not going to break up with that. But in case you want, hopefully not, Please do it with honesty and fairness, not just text it or use what apps, what apps uh, because in the time of conversational business, you can do it in a much smarter way. And I will just show that to you. Hello. Hi. Can I talk to Diane, please? Speaking. Hi, Diane. I'm calling on behalf of John to schedule an appointment. For what? The appointment for you to come pick up your belongings from John's apartment. Excuse me? John would like you to remove your belongings from his apartment. What are you talking about? I'm very sorry, but John has decided to end your relationship. Is this a joke? Put John on the phone. I'm sorry, John's not currently available. What? Where is John? I cannot believe this. This is bullshit. Mm-hmm. How does 10 a.m. sound? Are you fucking kidding me? Oh. If 10 a.m. is not available, what time is suitable for you? Fuck you! Okay, let's get serious again. But you can see conversation AI will be part of our uh, daily life. There's so much use cases you can apply, uh, not only the customer service area. Uh, when it comes to conversation AI, it's important to understand that there are two different layers. You can see it in the picture. We have an audience, you have a company, and you want to engage with the audience. You can do that via different channels, devices, touch points, whatever. The first layer is to understand the request, the intent of your customers. Maybe you heard of natural language processing, natural language understanding. In this field, we are pretty much advanced using AI. Uh, particularly when it comes to the English language. So it's, it's, it really works well to, to detect intents. The second layer is we have to give an answer accordingly. And usually here we have more the approach, the rather approach of if-then rules. But you can also use artificial intelligence not only to understand the intent of the customers, but also to give the right answer. And I think in the last two years, there have really been great achievements. What you can see here, it's called MENA. It's a framework from Google. They launched it in January, February of this year. And, and you can check it out in the internet. And you see some dialogue on, on the left side. There's no human behind. It's just artificial intelligence. It's not rule-based. They train billions of data to come up with this kind of dialogue. And if you can see what about the quality, you see, and please be aware of that, we human beings are not perfect. <laughs> so if you look at the benchmark, it's 86. So this is a measurement of communication quality and efficiency. And you can see Mina is pretty close to human beings. There's another uh, really exciting technology out there. It's called GDP3. It's part of the open AI framework of Elon Musk. And this is a really amazing tool, automatically uh, generating text messages. And Elon Musk decided not to launch this tool and not to put it public because the tool is that smart that you could create fake news easily. And Elon Musk do not want to run the risk to create fake news. So what I'm trying to say is now we live in a world of if then. It's a rule-based world when it comes to chatbots. But this will change in the upcoming years because we have great achievements 
uh, we can use artificial intelligence not only for detecting intents, maybe voice intents or text intents. We can even come up with perfect customer experience in terms of giving the right um, answer. Okay. Um, but conversational AI means more than just talking to your customer, having chatbots, whatever. I think that goes beyond. Maybe you think, okay, I have Alexa at home and I'm ask Alexa about the weather and all that stuff. But um, the devices are getting smarter and smarter. So you have to think beyond that Echo Alexa or Google Home. I give you an example. Last year in Las Vegas at the CES, they introduced the first toothbrush uh, equipped with Amazon Alexa with AI inside. And, and, and you would say, oh, does it make sense? Uh, you must be really desperate to talk to your toothbrush, right? And it's not that easy to talk to your toothbrush while you uh, use it. So, of course, the idea is maybe you do it not in the right way. Maybe it's used, then the system can automatically um, order a new one, okay? So devices get smarter. And, and within the field of sex tech, they also launched the first vibrator uh, equipped with AI, with Alexa. You, you see there are no limitations. So what I'm trying to say, all the devices are getting smarter. There's AI inside, and they will be connected with each other. You know that, Internet of Things, smart home, Internet of humans, and at the end of the day, Internet of everything. Okay? So it's not only this conversational interface talking to your customer. It becomes uh, the brain of a new digital ecosystem which is evolving over the time. And that not only works for the smart speaker, you can also apply that in the messenger world. For example, if you look at WeChat. WeChat covers the whole customer journey based on conversation AI. Everything is done by AI in this ecosystem. So it goes beyond how can I use WeChat, how can I use Amazon Alexa. I know that sounds rather visionary, but I'm pretty sure that we have this conversation AI as the brain for the upcoming ecosystems we are living in. Another example, it's a more creative part. It's uh, the job of media planning. You know, the question is how to spend my media budget. So spend it for, for Google, for newspaper, for, for ads on television. So the question, how can I derive the optimal media mix? How can I get the, the perfect budget allocation? And as you know, it's not that transparent, this process, because there's sometimes some black box and, and you know, there are kickbacks and all that stuff. It's, mm. So AI have, do not, it does not have an agenda. So you can use AI for media planning to come up with a rather objective and empirical-based media plan. And AI is not only taking into account the static and linear relations, but also the dynamic and non-linear relations. So if you use AI for media planning, you get a rather objective, data-driven recommendation how to use your money. And there's one agency doing that job, providing this AA as a service. It's called Blackfoot 7. And I think I, I, I like the slogan. The future media agency is not an agency. It's an AI. So I think sooner or later, AI will outclass human being when it comes to media planning. OK. Now let's come to content marketing, content creation, and also the more creative part of storytelling. So as you can see, we are pretty much advanced in the field of how can we organize and classify content based on AI, tagging, classification, all this stuff. Another interesting thing is you can use AI to increase the likelihood that uh, the customer is going to read your newsletter, that it's convert in some way. OK, you can, can use AI to predict which are the words that are most likely to resonate with the audience. Another example is we can use AI to personalize content. Then, of course, we talked about the chatbots. But the finishing touch is how can we use AI to create new content? Does that work? Yeah, it works. Um, maybe you know that a lot of press releases, weather reports, sport news are already written by an AI. But even the more creative part is written by an AI. This is an example. It's uh, used by, by a, um, IBM Watson, the AI, AI framework. 
And uh, what they did, they crawl all the data out there on the internet that are related to marketing. Then they use AI uh, to create the next edition of the drum. Uh, you can read it on the internet. It's not that bad. You can also see a video where all the employees and editors are bored because they have nothing to do. It's not the driverless car. It's a driverless um, magazine. Another example, uh, Lexus uses AI to create a commercial spot. That doesn't mean that you press a button, the AI button, and the AI automatically uh, creates a new commercial, okay? But it helps you to come up with the right storyline. It helps you to come up with the right visuals. So it's a kind of co-creation. It supports the process of being creative. Another example in this field of content creation is Netflix. You all know Netflix, and you all know the trailer you can watch at Netflix. And these trailers are not created manually. They're based on AI and big data. So maybe some of you guys would like to see a fast driving car. Some of you might see some actors. So the AI automatically predict what are the trailers that are most likely that you will watch the video or the film, whatever. So it's a kind of hyper-personalization. We personalize not only the message, we personalize the content. So we have a one-to-one -one production of trailers at Netflix. And if you think that through the end, I think we will also have advertisement that is one-to-one -one personalized to your audience. And um, actually, um, Tencent is uh, working on this these days. And I will provide you with some insight how that could look like if you use AI to automatically uh, display ads in a very personal and dynamic way. I think pretty impressive. And this brings me to my last slide so that we have enough time uh, to have this uh, uh, discussion and uh, hopefully I can ask you quick, answer your questions. I just want to leave you with one final uh, slide and this is a short outlook. Um, we talked very much about marketing use cases and new technology that, that uh, evolved over the time. But behind all this are human beings. And I think we are all aware of the fact that AI will have an impact on our jobs, of course. I know this slide, at the first glance, looks rather complex, but it's pretty easy. So on the left side, you see jobs that are safe. On the right side, you see jobs that are vulnerable, that are at risk. Uh, the upper jobs are good paid. The lower jobs are not good paid. That's the whole story. And so I do the reality check. You see the teacher. So the good news is seem to be safe. Well, that's good news. The bad news, you do not get a lot of money. So I'm used to that. Um, you see a lawyer, for example. I'm not sure if that is really the right uh, position because there's a software called Leverton. There's an AI-based software that goes through tons of contracts, finding the, the issues, and also generate new contracts. Uh, you see the sales rep, you just think of the, the store example. I, I wouldn't say that sales are going to be replaced, but the job profile will change over the time in a sense of augmented intelligence. And then I find some really interesting uh, job profiles. Maybe you're looking for a new job. Maybe this is some food for thought. We have a machine people ethic manager. We have a memory augmented therapist. We have an inbuilt marketing architect. And we had a bot creative. You might say, I'm kidding. No, this are real, these are real uh, job description. And I think it's very easy to, to think of job that will be replaced by AI. But we usually have a lack of fantasy which jobs will evolve over the time in marketing, sales, and service because of AI. OK. Hopefully, I'm not going to replace by AI because I love this kind of presentation. And in particular, 
I love this kind of exciting discussion after this. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. And hopefully we have an exciting discussion now. And hopefully we have a discussion among real people and you're not represented by your digital agent. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, in behalf of everybody, first of all, I do just some clapping. So just imagine that this is about more than 100 people now clapping. Uh, that's one of the things we haven't really got uh, artificial intelligence or, or even support for to do a right clapping in, in webinars. I think that's something the tech should really change. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I personally found it very, very interesting. I'm quite sure that there will be some questions. So everybody now, you have that um, comment box, the chat box in the lower right of your screen. Just try to use that one. And if you have a question for Peter, and I'm sure there are some questions, just write it down there and we will be happy um, to, to use that question. Oh, the first ones are already coming. Um, give me a second, I will do that that way. Mm -hmm. So here's the first questions coming from Olivier. What advice would you give to a direct marketing company that wants to start using AI to enhance marketing effort for its clients? What would be the first step? Yeah, the very good question. I think you should be very clear about the use case um, because I know it's sometimes confusing. There's so much opportunities, the window of opportunity is that big using AI. So where to start, I think is the most important thing. And usually I would say the customer journey is a perfect basis in order to figure out what is a perfect use case. So what is the best phase of the customer journey where you can start? And then you should uh, figure out what is a use case that has a high business impact. And it's also feasible in a sense that you have the data. Once again, it makes and breaks with data. So you have to be a very clear understanding, do we have the data in order to run AI? So sometimes I start projects and we, unfortunately, we have to come to the conclusion that we have to wait with the AI project because before you have to have a data strategy. You have to be very clear which data are available, which data are worth fostering, which data are missing. And in case data are missing, how can we bridge that gap? So my advice would be not to start with a full blow and, and uh, you know, start with 100 PowerPoint slides, explain what I can do in the marketing area. Try to find a showcase. Try to figure out the potential for a certain use case. And that was exactly the idea why I showed so many use cases. And, and then try to showcase this use case to get a feeling how AI works. And then step by step, you can extend this approach. Um, but really, my advice is you have to be aware that you need to have the data in place, otherwise you cannot apply AI. And by the way, because I think that's a really important point, a lot of people are telling me we do not have the data to run AI. Um, there are so many opportunities uh, to get the data. Uh, for example, there's open data. There's so much data free of charge. Or you can synthesize data. You can artificially generate data to use. Or Maybe you share data with your uh, competitors, maybe. So it's to, to set up um, uh, um, alliances to, to, to share data, for example. So sometimes I think it's an excuse. We do not have the data. You, you need to have a data strategy in place to come up with your first um, showcase using AI marketing. Peter, there's another question regarding the post office. Uh, how, how can we use? Give me a second. There it is. How can we use AI, artificial intelligence, in post offices? Or let's not, let's not say just the office, but the whole postal operator from the from the sending the post, collecting it, and using it. So how how would you say where are? So it's also the first one. Hmm? So so it's it's not a physical one. Also the digital post office or. I would say let's stay with the digital, uh, with the physical one first. I think we, we all talk about multi-channel, omni-channel management. So I think in the physical world, it's not that easy. We can can use QR codes. We can use you know digital uh, signage and all that stuff. I think the strength of AI, to be honest, is how can we use digital data and how can we deliver a perfect customer ex experience in the digital world. But even though you need to have customer insights. 
And if you want to deliver perfect customer experience in the post office, you know what your customer is interested in. And, and you can even use digital data using AI, and you can transfer this insight also in the physical world. I think there is not that clear cutting dividing line. This is digital world and this is a physical world. You can use the insights that come out of the digital world based on AI also for the physical world and delivering a customer experience. So um, I think the biggest potential of AI is if you can apply it in a digital environment, that's for sure, but you can use the learnings also in the physical world. And what I see is that at least some of the postal operators are already using AI in a very interesting way. So uh, starting with, uh, for example, sorting the post, uh, they use AI in, in uh, letter recognition and to, to recognize where the letter should go. I know that a lot of, of the postal, the pass, parcel services are using chatbots uh, in customer service. Uh, to, to give answers to where is my package at the moment. Um, so I think there are quite a lot of, of application areas where postal operators are already using AI or AI technology. So there's uh, the other side of AI is often uh, data protection. So um, is it uh, some kind of things going against the other, other each other or is it something where where data protection might even help or how do you see that so in particular in europe we are faced with the gdpr and sometimes it's not that easy to do ai because you need to use data but i think sometimes we use data protection as an excuse not to use ai there are several ways to use ai that are completely compliant with data protection uh, you don't need to know the name of your customer. You can work with anonymous data. You can use artificial generated data. Um, so to be honest, not that easy because uh, the data protection is quite challenging and you have to have some ideas how to use AI. But I can say I, it's not a promoter actually for AI projects, but I would say it's not a showstopper. There are several ways to run AI projects that are compliant with data protection. Um, and I'm, I think I really appreciate data protection, but first of all, I think we should uh, focus on the value of data and how can we unleash uh, the value of data and not to talk in the first uh, step, how can we protect data? So I think sometimes the uh, discussion goes in the, in the wrong direction, but the good news is you can use AI uh, and you're not in, in conflict with, with, with data protection, all this stuff. Uh, speaking of data, what are the first steps for a data strategy? Yeah, okay, very good question. First of all, you have to know which data are available. Okay, so you have to have a very clear understanding of the current situation. Then you should try to figure out which data are missing. And uh, data strategy means uh, you should come up with ideas how to bridge that gap. So maybe how can we capture data? Um, so the most important point is to, to have a big picture of the current status when it comes to data, to figure out which data are missing, and to figure out how can we, can we fill that gap um, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of ways to fill that gap uh, for data alliances, open data, uh, synthesized data, and all that stuff. So, But this should be really the first step before you think of using AI to have this clear understanding of your data. And data strategy also means that you have an idea how to work on the data, how to get the missing data. And once again, I think this should be the first step when you're trying to, to enter the AI um, uh, project theme. Uh, are there any AI innovations you know of in the logistics section? So that's not very much related to, to the marketing area, but um, I think when it comes to Internet of Things, so as I told you, every device gets uh, smarter. So I think if you, if you track device, if you track things, um, you can, can use AI. So there's no, I think, no boundaries. Right? I would say I'm not an expert in logistics, to be honest. But I think um, when it comes to physical goods, they also equipped by QR codes. They all get more and more digital, and so they produce data you can use to optimize logistics. Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, that also belongs to logistics, but I have no uh, exciting use case I could talk about. 
Well, I, what's coming to my mind is Uber, for example. They don't see themselves as a, as a taxi corporation. Oh, they see really themselves as a data corporation. And they use a huge amount of, of AI to, to make sure uh, that the right Uber car is at the right position at the right time. They use AI to, to detect how much money they can uh, get at, at a certain point of time for, for a certain ride. So that would be one of the, the examples that is coming to my mind. Um, from where should we start? Is there some kind of minimum requirement for AI, which is a very interesting question as we are not a big post operator, but one of the smaller ones. So what is the investment in AI? Where, where does it start? Okay. I think the good news is we have some kind of democratization of AI. So 20 years ago, uh, you have to spend millions of dollars to run an AI project. Now, the, the most advanced AI software out there, for example, Google TenderFlow, just to give an example, is open source, is free of charge. And I talked about big data, but you can also start with small data. And the, new, the good news is there's also a new method, it's called transfer learning. You can, even if you have just small amount of data, you can try to transfer them in an even bigger environment. Um, so the, the good news is there's no minimum requirement when it comes to budget. Of course, you need some data scientists or people that are eager to use that. Um, you can start with a small amount of data to get the first insights. The software is available. So I think the, the really good news is that there's no uh, minimum requirement. Uh, I think the, the most important thing is you have to be eager to do that. You have to be willing to do that. You have to be curious about that. I think that's the most important thing. And I wouldn't say you need at least 100,000 euro, you need 1,000 data sets. That's, that's, that's not the point. I think you, you should try it. And the good news is that it's not that minimum requirement from my point of view. There's a question about why can we not have a universal language for AI, like IT programming language available for anyone to use? Um, I think that's you just answered that a little bit, a bit that most of the, well, well, not most, but a lot of AI systems are now open source and you can use them free of charge. And there are a lot of data sets out there which you can use free of charge. So do we have some kind of universal language for AI or is it very, very different from the different systems? It depends on the system. And um, if you look at the different systems I explained, we have Amazon Alexa, Google Home. So they all came up with their own AI language because they want to battle about the AI who has the best AI system in place. So we're working for quite a long time to get this universal language of AI, to get the standard everybody can apply. But don't forget there are companies behind that want to push certain um, ideas. And even though if you talk about open source, that doesn't mean that we have this uni language, universal language. So we have to be very much aware of the fact that we have to manage different AI languages. I would really appreciate uh, to have this universal AI language, but I think we won't have this in the near future. Peter, thanks a lot for your very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot for answering all these questions. I see that we are one minute before 10, uh, at least German time, so one minute before the end of our thing. So once again, thank you very much and a clapping from everybody all around. Um, for all of you um, who found this interesting, we will have the next innovation talk, the number two talk on December the 8th. And we have a totally different topic, which has, but there are some similarities. We will have a topic which is social selling with LinkedIn. So all, you all know LinkedIn probably, but you found that over Corona, over COVID-19, COVID social selling is getting more and more important. And we found a book about that, which is LinkedIn versus Locked Out. And we will get an innovation talk about the LinkedIn strategy. You will get tips and tricks how to use LinkedIn. And we will even do live profile checks with all of you. So keep um, on and I would be happy to see you again on December the 8th for our next innovation talk in our innovation talk series. Thanks a lot, Peter, once again. Thanks a lot to the UPU DMAB. And thanks a lot to everybody being in this innovation talk. And I'm happy to see you again early December. And that's the end for today. Thank you, everybody. And uh, take care. And please stay healthy, most of all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.